What is this green box around my face putting me into a category, putting you into a category? It seems to know that there's a person there and there are certain characteristics about that person it's trying to identify. It's quite funny because it's spitting out all these crazy things like call girl, queen mother, trollop, alcoholic, a failure, a loser, a non-starter. How does it know? Why does it think that about me? To understand ImageNet Roulette, we have to understand two things first. The first, Amazon Mechanical Turks. Sounds quite space age. In 1769, Hungarian nobleman Wolfgang von Kemplen created a device that astonished Europe. He had seemed to have invented a machine that could play chess and beat everybody it challenged. In the 1700s, what a marvel that would be. It toured Europe and beat many chess masters. It was a wooden mannequin dressed in a fur robe and a turban and the inventor called it a Turk or a mechanical Turk. The truth behind his little game, of course, was actually that there was a chess master human hidden away behind the scenes, working all the cogs and gears and ultimately winning the games. There are many crowd worker websites and services out there, but I think that Amazon's MTurk or Mechanical Turk is one of the best known. And the purpose behind it is simple. There are a lot of tasks out there in the world that machines simply can't do yet or may never be able to do. And these are dubbed human intelligence tasks. Since human intelligence actually was the solution to this 1700s chess playing machine, hence the name. Human intelligence tasks like these are one of the biggest bottlenecks to AI and machine learning advancement and all technological advancement because there's simply so many things that machines just can't do yet. It's another one of those weird fake jobs in the gig economy that yes you can make real money off it but is it enough to be paying you fairly. One study showed that the average MTurk worker would earn an average of $2 an hour. Obviously, if you play the game long enough, you get better and better, you might be able to access and unlock higher earnings. But ultimately, it's incredibly exploitative. It's not paying people a fair wage. And true, they don't have to do it if they don't want to, but work has a value and your time has a value ultimately. And these are long, monotonous tasks. That's a different debate, but that's the background that you need to understand what's going to come next. ImageNet was created in 2009 by a Stanford professor of the name Fei-Fei Li. Its original desire was to map out the entire world of objects. And since it's 2019 now, this was 10 years ago, so it's been around for a decade. Through mapping out the entire world of objects, essentially what it was was a big database of images and each image would have a word or a categorization placed against it. Now, when it comes to computers trying to see, since we've not figured out a way to actually create mechanical eyeballs yet, computers see in different ways. There's always a loophole and a workaround. And the one which is most prevalent is training computers on a large data set of images with words against them, convenient. So then when it is presented with new images, it can use every single piece of data that it has been given and learned from to make its best guess or assumption of what is in this current unfamiliar image. And then it can add this image to its database and so on and so on and keep growing and learning and its database getting richer and richer. I would say that almost all projects that feature any kind of image recognition will have cross paths with ImageNet at some point simply because it's one of the oldest database, one of the largest database I think it's got over 14 million images, 27,000 words. All that data has been fed in to pretty much every single image recognition that software that exists today. But where do the words come from and where do the images come from? The words harken back to a 1980s project, WordNet. It was developed in Princeton and essentially it groups synonyms together and tries to classify many, many words in the English language. And there are nine key headings of which other words may feed into. These are plant, geological formation, natural object, sport, artifact, fungus, person, animal, and miscellaneous. Already, I don't want to start beef in the natural world community, but isn't like fungus kind of like a plant? I mean, I guess that it's not, but like the two places that you mainly would see fungus is like in the fridge on your food that's gone off or like in the forest, or like as part of like, you know, the natural environment. Either way, I'm glad that it's put a lot of effort into being able to identify many types of mold and mushroom. I believe that already on these top nine categories, it's gonna hark into there being a little bit of more drama as we dive in. And certainly the author of the piece which I'm talking about, and I'm gonna talk all about what that is towards the end of the video. They highlight a particular issue when it comes to sexuality, 
gender classifications for people. I'm an adult female woman and to get to me in ImageNet or WordNet, for example, you'd have to follow the branch of natural object, body, human body. And then the options within this category are male body, female body, person, juvenile body, adult body. And then underneath adult body, then there is adult male body and adult female body and so on. But it gets really weird because they highlight that the word hermaphrodite is in here, which I wasn't too familiar with, but it is um, a probably more outdated term or I don't know, like hypermedical, I'm not really sure. I think intersex is the more politically correct term, but you can find uh, hermaphrodite is categorized under person, sensualist, bisexual. Oh, um, and already the word sensualist is bad enough and sensualist's definition is a person devoted to physical, especially sexual pleasure, a dedicated sensualist. So and not only to categorize all bisexual people as sensualists, um, you know, highly devoted and motivated by sexual pleasure is offensive to say the least, let alone hermaphrodite slash intersex people. And needless to say, like this is really inaccurate and offensive ways to categorize people. Other words within the sensualist category are switch hitter, which uh, is an outdated way to refer to bisexual people. There's also sucker, erotic, foodie, voluptuary, hedonists, playboy, wanton, admirer, bad guy, censor, deliverer, rich person, and case. Like what are all these words and why are they all under the category sensualist? I think we'll all agree that this database is outdated and insufficient to say the least. At one of my jobs that I used to have, we had a, we had to categorize, actually it was related to YouTube, we had to try and categorize YouTubers YouTubers, social media people, into the types of headings of categories of content that they might produce. And that was really hard because YouTube gives you like, I don't know, like eight or nine categories. It's like auto and transport, people and blogs, uh, how to and DIY, sports, like loads of random ones. Um, they're not really sufficient for the job. And so we were like, well, let's expand it so people know how to um, categorize themselves when it comes to using this web website that we were developing. And even doing that was hard enough. And we did loads and loads of R&D with that. We got people in, focus groups, trying to like whittle it down, make sure that we weren't um, double stepping anything. Um, and we still ended up with loads and we tried to get it as best as we could. I don't work there anymore, so I don't know what's happened. Needless to say, it's one of those tasks which requires you to go over and over it with a fine tooth comb, make sure that you are making it as minimalist, concise and accurate as possible. And it's not just kind of like, let's word dump a load of words down and see what we can get go from there. This is just touching the surface, might I add. Within the ImageNet, WordNet database, there's all sorts of sexist, ableist, classist, racist terminology, offensive words used to categorize people within the people category or you know, other people, other things, bodies, etc. Now, ImageNet operated for many, many years just using, I believe, scraped images from the internet. So it said that it only stored thumbnails, much like a search engine would, for example, Google doesn't own or host many of the images which you can find on Google Images. Um, it just shows them when you type in keywords. Um, so that's how it was able to kind of use all of these people people's images to train itself. And obviously it trained itself with Amazon Mechanical Turks. I believe that this service was one of the largest customers of Amazon MTurk for a very long time. And I believe that it would essentially show one of these images in its database, or rather the thumbnail of the images in its database to a user or a worker on MTurk. It would ask them to categorize this image, or rather it would give it a description, for example, and then ask it to click which one fit it. So for example, a guitar, it would say, please only click any of the images which have guitars in them. Isn't this sounding familiar to proving that you're not a robot? Um, I wonder what Google does with all the information that we decipher for it. Like, you know, oh, click on the crosswalk on the Google Maps images. Oh, uh, type what's in this capture. I don't work for free <laughs> and I don't work for pennies. Anyway, that's another debate. So anyway, yes, it used MTurks, very, very low paid individuals to 
inform and build its database. Another issue with this is, especially when it comes to identifying human emotion, if it is just using scraped images which are orphaned from the actual subject of the image, for example, if it's a picture of me smiling, the enter will come along, look at my face smiling and categorize it to happy or surprised or in love. Or if I'm looking a little bit sad or neutral, it might just say, yeah, sad, depressed, neutral, and so on. But what I'm looking and what I'm feeling are two different things. It's not factoring in the declared emotion felt by the subject, felt by me. It's simply the perceived emotion by the onlooker, who I don't believe is really incentivized enough to actually get it right. What's their background? What gives them the authority to know what a guitar looks like, to know what happiness looks like on a face, to know what an executive woman looks like versus a trollop, for example, if we're going to use their categorizations. So then we come to ImageNet Roulette, and that's why I've got a green box around my face, telling me who I am, according to this database. ImageNet Roulette was built using the data from ImageNet to bring light to the insufficiency of the data sets which we are currently using as law in all of our technological endeavors during this current velocity of AI and machine learning. It was designed by Kate Crawford and Trevor Pagan who are the prime sources for me for this video. I read Kate and Trevor's incredible essay, paper, article, I don't know. They've set up a website called excavating.ai and they set up this ImageNet Roulette, obviously. It really opened my eyes, resonated with me. It's a very long read, but a very good one. I really recommend you go over and learn more because I don't know enough about this to actually have really conveyed the information as compellingly as they have and as accurately, but I tried my best. But ImageNet Roulette is actually going to go offline on Friday, this Friday, the 27th of September, 2019, because it's achieved what it needed to do by creating a viral little widget that you could just upload your picture into, let it spit out, what does it think I am? A slovenly woman? Oh haha, ha, how funny, oh my god, I'm gonna share it with my friends. Let's bring some light to this, shall we? Because through this, its objective has been achieved. ImageNet's people service is insufficient at accurately identifying the people within them without any bias. The ImageNet people category has now gone offline, but not before, over the past decade, thousands and thousands of individuals, companies, developers have downloaded its database and used it to train their own AI, to train their own machine learning, and coded it as law into their project. Nowadays, we can unlock phones and houses with our faces, but when it looks at us, what other assumptions is it now making? The truth is that technological assumptions are now the norm. Google seems to know what I want to search for before I've even had the thought in my head. There's a race for companies to become the most useful technological aid to humans, but now we're being faced with oppressively engineered technological suggestions. And these suggestions will influence us whether we like it or not. Machine learning doesn't remove bias, it encodes it and amplifies it. While we're still working from biased and outdated data sets, we're creating further divisiveness within our society. I'd love to know what you thought. What did ImageNet Roulette think that you were? By the way, ImageNet Roulette doesn't save any of your images, it doesn't reuse them, it simply just deletes them as soon as you've uploaded them. At least that's what they say, I'm sure it's true. Do go and read more on excavating.ai. It was so fascinating. I think that if you find this topic really interesting, I certainly do, it's something that I spent a lot of time thinking about. Given that my first-hand experience of being a YouTuber and being someone who creates content online, I day-to-day am -day, faced with algorithmic dictation of content, you know? Well, I want to make this organically in my head, but oh, well, this will get demonetized, so I shouldn't talk about this. Censorship through algorithms. This is a popular trend at the moment, so maybe I'll make this. Already, my natural organic thoughts of what I want to create are being diverted through these paths and through these channels, and it's a really big issue, and I just think that we're being used as guinea pigs. You know, we're being tested upon, we're being given these algorithms, and then, you know, it's up to us how it works, and I know that someone who makes content online is just the tip of the iceberg, but then this will filter down through every single user of the internet. Many more uh, general users of Instagram, for example, will only post pictures if they'll make sure to get over 10 likes or whatever it is to change it into a number rather than just names underneath the picture, and they'll delete it if it doesn't hit that milestone. And there's a lot of things which will feed into, well, how can I make sure that I get those 10 likes? I'm gonna do this and this and this because this does well on Instagram, this time is the best time to post, X, Y, and Z. As you can tell, I spend a lot of time thinking about this. We we are in extremely treacherous waters at the moment. We don't know what's going to happen and they don't know what's going to happen because it's not been tested on enough people. We're simply a guinea pig generation and if it all goes wrong, 
that's it. We just gotta live through it. Let me know your thoughts. Let me know what internet roulette categorized you as <laughs> before Friday, September the 27th, when you won't be able to do it anymore. Thanks so much for watching, and I look forward to seeing you all next time. Make sure you subscribe if you wanna see more videos on Ginger. I've been Becky. Take care.